Hi, this is Pastor Jim, and welcome to your Holiness Connection podcast. It is podcast number 51. Today, we're going to continue to talk about the greatest success principle Jesus ever taught. We began on the last podcast with kind of how not to think. The passage is Matthew chapter 25, 14 through 30. So go ahead and turn there. If you're at a place where you can, do that with me. Uh, but as always, I want to make a couple announcements. I want I want you guys to keep praying for people. We've got several people. I'm going to try to announce their names next podcast. I know last week I talked about Lana and I talked about Jim who are starting Quick Start, but there are many, many more. So would you keep praying? I believe this, that as you and I work together in building the kingdom of God, that the power of God would come in our midst. I mean, and so let's just hear the voice, let's continue to hear the voice of God together. Would you do this wherever you are, wherever you're listening, whatever your location, I want you to tell somebody about this podcast. Tell them that we've got to hear the voice of God together. We've got to hear this word together because I believe that the church, the body of Christ is going to make a huge difference in our society and in our culture right now. I don't believe our day is five years from now. I believe our day is right now. God's speaking to us right now, and he's teaching us about how to align with what God has for us. So again, I want to welcome to our podcast today. My topic is the greatest success principle Jesus ever taught. It is in Matthew chapter 25. If you're a first time listener, hit that subscribe button for me. I would appreciate it. If you've been listening, tell somebody, tell somebody, help them find it on the YouTube channel and, uh, Just get them where they need to hear the Word of God together. Today, I'm more excited than I have been in quite a while. God is moving in some great ways. If you try to go to our website, uh, activeinmission.org, it is under reconstruction. So uh, I believe they have it set up where you can still donate. But I believe you have to go www.activeinmission.org. Now, that may have already changed. But uh, if not, if you're having trouble getting there, uh, just email me and uh, let me know that. And we will work with you to get that uh, gift in. So we appreciate so much everybody who supports us, supports the work of this ministry. Because really, it's not my ministry. This is... This is a church ministry. This is our ministry. This is the body of Christ ministry. And as I teach on these things, I hope you gain and grow in your walk with God. So let's just keep praying for one more disciple. And let's hear what God has to say. Now, I told you I was going to continue. I'm going to do a review in just a second. But I told you I was going to continue today on teaching on Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. But I want to review where we started because now that this this podcast and the next couple podcasts, I'm going to I'm going to show us how to develop what I believe are the three attitudes that are necessary to to fulfill what God has called us to do and to complete destiny while we're here on this earth. Okay, there's mindsets that hinder us. We talked about that last time. But now, how do we develop this mindset of agreement? It's that mindset of agreement that allows the church to align together in mission and purpose. So let's review for just a second. Again, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. I'm not going to read that right now, but I want to go over a review. Last time we said there were three mindsets that would hinder a person from being either a five-talent or a two-talent person. Remember the five gained five and, and, uh, and had 10 and the two gained two and had four, but the one just hid his, buried his talent, didn't do anything with what God had given him or her. And because of that, God said, I'm going to take the one talent you have and I'm going to, I'm going to give it to somebody else. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you guys, as disciples, see, 
as one as one more disciple believers, I'm going to ask you guys to do this. I'm going to ask you guys to be five talent and two talent people, because God wants you to fulfill your destiny while you're here on this earth. What were the three mindsets? We said the first the first mindset was this. We said the first mindset was some people are agenda driven. In other words, they got their own goals, they got their own design, they got their own plan, and they don't fit the church. And I'm not talking about a local church, but they don't fit the church. In other words, one more disciple is not my agenda. One more disciple comes out of Matthew 28 and verse 20, where God says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's not my agenda. That's his agenda. I'm See, I don't have my own agenda. When I was younger, I have to admit, I had my own agenda. I wanted to build church the way I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it my way. I didn't really care what everybody else thought about it. I was just going to do it my way. This is what God's taught me over the years. He says, Jim, this is not about you. It never was about you, and it never will be about you. It's always been about Jesus. It is now about Jesus, and it will always be about Jesus. And we're going to help create an environment where one more disciple can happen. I'm going to submit to him, not my own agenda. We also said that there's another mindset that hinders people from fulfilling destiny here on this earth, and it is an acceptance mindset. Acceptance is this, that people need other people to make them feel good about themselves. In other words, they'll take a relationship in their life and they'll say that relationship, if they have to give up some of their morals in order to keep that person in their life, they'll do it. Okay? That's what acceptance, acceptance becomes the higher thing. I just don't want to, I just don't want to be rejected in my life. I just don't want to be that person that it feels like I'm put down. Somewhere they've been put down. Somewhere that they've felt rejection in their life. They've felt the hurt and the pain of rejection. And they'll do almost anything for acceptance. And what the Bible says is you can't be an acceptance person. Most of the middle class fits in acceptance. They, they just want to be okay. They don't, they don't want to... They don't have to have, they don't want to be poor, but they don't want to be super rich. They just want to be okay. They just want to be accepted in the community. And God says there's nothing wrong with orderly acceptance and, and healthy relationships. But he says, but you can't live to be accepted by others. Acceptance people always compare themselves to other people. What others have, what they don't have, what they should have. How do I look in front of other people? You know, that's the type of acceptance. They're always busy, but they're always unfulfilled. The agenda-driven person is always bound, never free. There's a third kind we said, and we talked about the addiction-driven person. Addiction-driven person. Addiction-driven people are very, very close to a gender-driven person. However, they've made some decisions in their life that are not healthy, and they've paid a heavy price for it. They're addicted. And this is not just this is not just drugs, legal or illegal. But I mean, you can get addicted to being negative. You can get addicted to pornography. You can get addicted to about just about anything in your life. In the Old Testament, I believe addiction would be idolatry putting something else ahead of God. And all of these are in some form putting something else ahead of God's place in our life. So I want us to be very, very careful about what we do with this. But I also want to say this to you, that if you know an addiction-driven person, they can be free. They can be free. Those, they have always, addiction people always trade something. They don't like going through the process. They don't like a process. They want a quick fix on everything. They don't want the process. They want a quick fix on everything. If they don't feel good today, then they'll take something to make them feel better. If they feel worse tomorrow, they'll have to take more. That's where addiction always goes. That's why you got to be very careful about guarding your heart. So those were kind of the, that's the review of last time. I don't want to take too much time there, but some of you may have heard me say that last time. Some may not, but but I think it's important to kind of lead into what we do. Now, there are three attitudes that we develop to counteract those three mindsets. All right, so now let's go to our text, Matthew chapter 25. Let's look at verse number 14. 
And that's, that's probably all I'm going to read for today. I might read a couple other verses just to give us the scenario. So let's read through 18. 14 through 18, Matthew chapter 25 says this, For it is just like a man going on a journey. He called his own slaves and turned over his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Let's talk about the first attitude that needs to be developed in order to fulfill destiny here on this earth. I want you to write this down if you can, or just put it on your phone, take the notes on your phone. The first principle, the first attitude to fulfill the greatest success principle Jesus ever taught is this. You are not an owner, but a steward of what you have. Let me repeat that. You are not an owner, but a steward over what God has given to you. He says this, he called his own slaves, his own servants, and turned over his possessions to them. Other translations will say servants rather than slaves. Manager might be another translation word. You're a manager and the owner of the shop and you're the manager of the shop. You don't own the shop. You just manage the shop. So here's kind of, that's kind of the context of what he says in verse 14 as he's starting off this, this uh, powerful truth that I think we all need to get a hold of in our lives. He says, look, I, God's saying, Anything that you have, you do not own it. If you're listening to this message near somebody, turn to them and say, you don't own anything. You don't own anything. I, I tell you, one of the freest things that ever happened to me in my life was one, I, when I was younger, I, 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 was, I was trying to make money. Oh, I was in the ministry. I was doing Christian work, but I wanted to make money. I wanted to have money. And... And one of the freest things that ever happened to me is when God capped my salary. I read a book, and one of the questions discussed in the book was this, how much is enough? How much is enough? That was an interesting thesis for one of the chapters, and so I continued to read. And he was saying, how much do you need to retire, and how much do you have to make, and how much is enough? And that began to speak to my heart. That began to show me something that I had not seen before because I just thought you make as much as you can make and you just put, a, put back as much as you can put back and you just live as, you know, as wealthy as you possibly can. And that that's would be what God had. But God began to show me something different. He began to say, Jim, if you follow that principle, that's more of the American dream principle, but that's not necessarily a biblical principle. You see, Jim, you don't own anything. You don't own anything. I've given you everything. You don't even own your own breath. You don't even own your own life. I gave you that life, and if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be here right now. And not only are you here because I created you, I, you're, you're only, you only stay here because I sustain you. Oh, yes, you need to take care of yourself and you need to do the best you can with what you have. But if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have anything at all. He capped my salary that day. And I tell this to people all the time. I said, if you give a million dollars to me, my salary won't go up. I'll have to put all of it towards the building of the kingdom of God. It won't build my retirement. It won't help me do something that I just want to do. My salary's capped. It's already capped. It's done. 
Everything that I take in, I put towards what God wants to do. Now, I, I, have, a, I have an income at my church and all that, but what I'm saying is this, guys. My salary is capped. I, I can't, he said, because as I bless you and as I favor what you do, you won't be able to keep it. It's not for you. It's for me. When I understood once and for all that I was not the owner of what I had, I was not the owner of what I earned, but somebody else was in charge of my life, it didn't make me feel depressed. It made me feel joyful like never before. And God has favored, favored my ministry. God has favored what I do. God favors the word that I teach and preach. But it's only his favor. It's only that, that place in your life where you understand that I am not an owner anymore. I don't own the house that I live in. It's God's house. And I'm not just being spiritual in my words. He really owns it. It's his. Oh, I know to the world, my name's on the dotted line. I understand that. But I'm telling you that my God owns everything that I have. I don't own a house. I don't own a car. I don't own my clothes. Guess what? You don't either. You may think you do. Because you say, I worked hard for that. And I bought that. And I paid for that. And I, you didn't do anything for that. You obeyed God. You you. You, you, you allowed him to work through you so you could accomplish something, and that's great. But I'm telling you, that doesn't make you an owner. That keeps you a steward because you're only taking of what someone else has provided for you, and you're doing the best you can with it. That's the very principle that he says. He says, he called his own slaves, his servants, his managers over, and he turned over his possessions to them. God, is, God owns it all. God owns the whole world. God owns all the authorities in the world, all the power in the world, all the wealth in the world, all the education in the world, all the business in the world, all the churches in the world, all the lands in the world, all the properties in the world. God is awesome. And I think sometimes just because we make something or, or we earn something, or I mean, you don't even own your family. Husbands, you need to tell you, you don't own your wife. Wives, you don't own your husband. Moms and dads, you don't own your kids. Those are blessings from God. They came from God. If it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have those kids. Those are blessings from the Lord. I know some days if you're raising kids and they're small, they don't always feel like a blessing. I get that. I've raised four. But what I'm saying is this. They're blessings from Almighty God. There's a bigger principle that we need to get a hold of, and it's the first mindset that I don't own anything in my life. When you start to get to where you're a steward, where you're a manager, whether you're a servant over what God has given to you, life becomes more full of joy and less worry. I don't have to worry about it. You know why I don't have to worry about it? Because I don't own it. God's given me something. It's been, it's been a precious gift. And I take that gift that he's given me and I do the best I can with the gift he's given me, but it's not mine. I'll never own it. I don't care if your nest egg's this big or if it's this big, you don't own it. I've done many funerals in the last 30, 40 years. You know what I know? Everybody has the same amount when I do that funeral. It makes no difference. It makes no difference at all. You see, we're not an owner of what we have. We're just a steward. We're just to do the best we can with it while we're here. God will have other instructions when we get to the hereafter with him. But for right now, this is what he says. Do the very best you can. With He's turned over. This is a powerful principle, isn't it? He has turned over his possessions to us. And I'm not just talking financially. He has turned over his spiritual possessions to the church. He has turned some things over. He has turned over to us authority in the earth. He has turned over us the power to see supernatural things happen in our lives and in the lives of others. He has given us the authority to make a disciple. There's two things that I work on in this ministry, the AIM Company, Active Admission, the AIM Company, and my, in my local church, Brevard Community Church. And God says this, he, there, there's two things that we work on and we try to synchronize it. You've heard me teach on them, but I'm going to repeat them because it's necessary. 
The first is Matthew 22. And I know some of you are going to say, this is just too simplistic, but it's not. Listen to me. In verse 37, he said this. He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great, greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I just did a series on that. That's the individual responsibility for every believer. The first thing that I'm about is to love God with all my heart, to love myself as God loves me, and then to love my neighbor as I love myself. In fact, I can't love my neighbor any more than I love myself. So I, and I taught last, I said, man, loving yourself like God loves you is the meat of the, is the meat of that sandwich. Loving God and loving others are the two slices of bread, but the meat is to love yourself like God loves you. And so what happens is it, and what I do is try to synchronize two things. So in my church and in this ministry, I will always talk about loving God. I believe in the power of perfect love. And I believe that you and I, born again believers, can have an experience with God and a life with God that is full of perfect love. We don't have, and when you walk in perfect love, you cast out fear. When fear gets cast out, people can really start living for the first time. You don't have to be afraid if the financial markets are going to crash. Okay, they may crash, they may not crash, but you don't have to be afraid if they do. Why? Because my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by his son, Jesus. Who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in the financial markets of the day? Are you trusting in God's power to provide? Amen. He's turned over his possessions to us. God owns it all. He owns all the gold. He owns all the silver. He owns all the stocks. He owns all the businesses. He owns all the cryptocurrencies now. He owns it all. God is not broke. God is creator God. He owns it all. He's coming to us and he's saying, love me with all your heart. That's the individual mandate that every one of us has. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be cleansed from a desire to sin and be filled with perfect love. That is the message of holiness. That's why we call this podcast the Holiness Connection. And it's that message that somehow, I believe, the last generation or so has been kicked out of the church. But, but I'm determined that it won't get kicked out of the church. I'm telling you, this is not about a holiness denomination. This is about the body of Christ fulfilling the will of God on the earth for the purpose of one more disciple. And that's the second part. The first part is this, that I love God. That's an individual mandate for every believer. But the second is what I've already mentioned. It's also in Matthew. It's Matthew 28. You know it You know it well. He says this, Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So I, I, I teach this. I teach the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and your neighbors yourself. And I teach the great commission as a corporate mission for the body of Christ. And I focus, now I teach that in different ways at different times, but I teach that message. And I believe it's the synchronization of the great commandment and the great commission that allows the church to be alive. And it allows the church to fulfill something in this earth that we couldn't do without that synchronization. And so I believe it's important that we focus on too. In other words, you just can't live life any, way, any old way you want to live it. God has a mandate for you. It's called the great commandment. But the church can't just do whatever it wants to do either because we have a great commission. And he says that we need to be focused, we need to be diligent, and we need to, we need to be proactive. We need to be the most missional people on the face of the earth. He's saying, you don't own your own life. That's the most freeing thing in the world. Oh, you're responsible. I, I believe that I need to work out. I believe I need to spend time in the Word of God. I believe I need to spend time with my family. I believe all of those things need to have. I believe I need to have the, a good diet. I believe I need to take care like the five talent or the two talent guy did. I believe I need to take care of what God has given to me, but I need to remind myself constantly and consistently and continually that I don't own anything that I have. It's all God's. It's all his. 
And when I when I get that mindset that I I don't I don't have the same type of pride. I don't have the same type of ego. I don't have the same type of possessiveness about what God has given to me, but, but, I, but I become a much more generous person. I also become a much more diligent person, a much more diligent person. I mean, this is powerful thing that God is teaching. You see, most people just think, you know, we hear this term all the time in America, self-made millionaire, self-made billionaire, and we got self-made, no one's self-made. You've been created by Almighty God. You didn't get here by yourself. You you were you were spoken you were spoken over from the foundation of the earth that you would be here at a certain time. You would have a destiny while you're here, and you would have God's life expectancy on you. And all that is true about you, and that's true about me. That's why it's so important that we walk in our identity in Jesus Christ. Our identity is supposed to be in him and him alone. Why is that? So we don't think anything about ourselves? No, we're supposed to love ourselves like God loves us. God loved us so much, he disciplined us. God's loved us so much, he forgave us. And if you can't forgive yourself and you can't discipline yourself, then you're not loving yourself like God loved you. I tell you what, this is one. This is just the first attitude. I'm going to teach on three. The next two, I'm going to do and uh, uh, two more attitudes that I believe God teaches us or Jesus teaches us in Matthew 25, 14 through 30 in this parable. And I want you to take the reason I, I was going to just give the three attitudes out, but he, he said, teach on these things. Just let it teach a little bit. Allow people to hear what the voice of God is saying. Attitude number one, you are not an owner of what you have. You are only a steward. The principle is best taught in the, in the principle of tithing. So I'm going to end with that. In Malachi chapter 3, it says this in verse number 7. Now, some of you, go, well, that's Old Testament. That, look, if you want to do New Testament giving, that's fine. Jesus said, give it all. Okay, so give 100%. But I want, I want to show you a principle in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 7, it says, Since the days of your fathers you have turned from my statues, you have not kept them. In other words, there's been disobedience. He says, Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. All right? But you ask, how can we re return? Then verse number 8 gives us the response. Will a man rob God? When you rob somebody of something, you're taking what does not belong to you. Yet you are robbing me, and you ask, how do we rob you? By not making, by not bringing the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse. And he says in verse 9, because of this disobedience, you are suffering under a curse. Not just you, but the whole nation suffers because you're still robbing me. Now he's talking to the church here. Then he says in verse 10 in the Holman translation, bring the full tenth into the storehouse. Tithe, everywhere it's used in scripture, is a tenth. Bring it into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Prove me in this. See if I won't do what I say that I'm going to do, says the Lord of hosts. See if I won't open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I won't even stop. I'll do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. I'm asking you as a manager. I'm asking you as a steward. I'm asking you as my slave. You don't own anything. Give me the first tenth. Give me the first tenth. Trust me with it. And then he goes on in verse 11. And he says, when you do this, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine and your field. And you will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Praise the Lord. You will be a delightsome land. You will see the hand of God move in your lives. Now, I'm not teaching on finances today. I'm teaching on the first attitude. You don't own anything. God owns everything and everyone, and that includes you and I. If you're not tithing, I'm simply giving you an opportunity right now. I'm giving you an opportunity right now. If you're not doing this on a consistent basis, I want you to begin to do this. 
as quick as you can. Do not wait. Do not hesitate. Do not be afraid. God will do what he said he was going to do. And I want you to go and I want you to take a tenth and I want you to give it to kingdom ministry. I, I want you to make a difference in the world. I want you to start thinking like I don't own anything that God gives me. He owns everything. He asked me to give him a tenth back to test him, to prove him, to see if he wouldn't take care of me. This is not just Old Testament, New Testament. I'm not teaching on that today, but I want to, I, I want to give you an opportunity to return to the Lord. If you've ever come to the place in your life where you think that you own it, I want you to learn how to give it back. Start with a tenth portion and give it to the Lord. I believe the Father is speaking to somebody in his heart today. I believe that the voice of God is going out over the airways today and, and you're going to hear what you need to hear. I know some of this teaching is gets uncomfortable. That's all right. That's how I teach. Okay, I love you in Jesus, but I, I, I want to pray for you now. I think this is important that we get this first thing. If they thought they owned it, then they could do what they wanted to with what they had. But if you don't own it, you're responsible for somebody else. I don't care what your position is here on this earth. You do not own anything that you have. And God says, I want a tenth of everything that you have up front. So I'm going to challenge you to do that. I believe that God's going to do something in your life. I believe I'm going to hear a testimony, not just one. I'll hear many testimonies of the favor of God. If you don't have a church where you're regularly attending and you want to support this podcast ministry, I would appreciate it. If you do, I'm going to ask you to put it in your local church. But whatever God's saying to you, sow that seed into a ministry that preaches and teaches the word of God that believes in the dynamic of the great commandment and the Great Commission being synchronized together. We don't own them. We're stewards over them. Let's do the best we can with what we have. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this day that we can come and just share the Word of God, share what you're laying on our heart. Father, I pray that you will take every person that hears this podcast, every one more disciple believer that hears this podcast, and you will begin to sow into them what they need to hear and what they need to obey out of the word of God. Lord, I pray that we will do it together. I pray we will do it by faith. And I pray that as we do this in the name of Jesus, you will raise up men and women who will be able to help finance the kingdom fulfillment on the earth right now. You will do something. You will do something in them. You will do something through them. And, and they, will be, they will be literally missional-minded people to help fund and finance what you've called the church to do. Father, I believe this, and I see it happening. I receive it done. I believe the word does not go away from us void. Father, I thank you that because we don't own anything, we can have a generous spirit with what you've left us with. God, I pray that we will, we will be faithful with it as your word tells us. And we receive together the power of the Holy Spirit in each of our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad you tuned in today. So glad you listened. Hope you enjoyed it today. Uh, next time will be Matthew 25 again, 14 through 30. And we're going to talk about the second attitude of the greatest to, to develop in order for the for us to fulfill the greatest success principle Jesus ever taught in Scripture. So I'm excited about being with you already. I look forward to it. As look at look behind me. This is this is beautiful South Carolina again. I want to tell you this: as long as I can be out on this porch, <laughs> I'm going to be out on this porch. I know in the winter I'm going to have to be in sometimes, but I really enjoy just teaching the Word of God and letting you see how good and how gracious and how beautiful God is. So you have a blessed day. We look forward to hearing from you and seeing from you what God is doing in your life. God bless, and we'll see you on the next Holiness Connection podcast.